Bible students. This is the Sunday Evening Bible Study. I'm Dr. Renee Milton, and today we're going to study 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 11. And if you enjoy these Bible studies, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and like this video. Well, my apologies that we've been away for a while. Sometimes uh, life gets in the way. So we are going to get started again where we left off at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's begin our reading. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers? Actually, then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So we left 1 Corinthians 5 with Paul talking about sexual immorality in the church, one that it had his father's wife. There's, this is something very important that Paul brings out in chapter 5 that it doesn't mean when he says separate that he's talking about separate yourself completely from the people of this world. He said because then you'd have to just go out of the world. But he's talking about a person that is claiming to be a follower of Christ and involved in these type of sexual sins that they should not be counted among them as a Christian or a saint. So we leave that chapter and he begins to talk about another problem that they have of people going to law, going to the courts against one another in the Corinthian church. He says, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Now, let me make it clear in this section, verses one through six, he is talking about everyday matters. He is not talking about a person that has been uh, abused or uh, there was uh, horrible uh, consequences to it. Uh, somebody has done a, a grievous uh, sin against somebody else that would involve the law. Because Paul says in another portion of scripture that the law is for the lawless. So if a person, just because they're a Christian, commits some type of sin that is against the law, the law should be involved. What he is talking about here is everyday matters. Now, small matters. How do we know this? 1 Corinthians 4. So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? So apparently he is talking here about everyday matters, matters of this life, small matters that could be solved with a meeting or a conversation. And the Corinthians were taking these matters to 
the unbelievers to the courts. And if they were solving the matters among themselves, they apparently were using people that were not known for a lot of wisdom among them. So he chastises them about that as well. Verse 6, he says, But brother goes to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Paul was also concerned about the image of God's church. If we cannot solve the smallest matters among ourselves, what does that say about us as followers of Christ? And how is that attracting the unsaved or the unbelievers to the community of Jesus Christ? So, this is the gist of verses 1 through 6. I know a lot of Christians say you should just never go to the unbelievers for anything. But that's not what this scripture is saying. He is talking about small, everyday things that could be solved with somebody in the church who had wisdom and could work out these matters among them. Certainly, if there's abuse going on, and I'm talking about everyday things now, if there's abuse going on, child abuse, if there's spousal abuse and that kind of thing, those matters should be brought to the case of the law if necessary. Because the law is for the lawless. If a person is going to act in an illegal way, then let the law deal with them. Everything cannot be solved in in the small circle of the community of the church. And this is why today we have things like mandatory reporters in some religious cases. Because everything cannot be, just be solved in a small community. And in fact, that is a lot of times how abusive situations or wrong situations happen. Everybody tries to solve them among themselves. Now let's go to the second set of verses here, verses 7 through 11, and it begins in verse 7. Actually then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? This is proof, again, that he is talking about something uh, not major, but something that they should be able to handle. They should be able to take. So these are, these are everyday matters that they should be able to solve among themselves. He says in verse 8, On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. So he's talking also about a sin that they are guilty of in defrauding one another, beat, swindling one another, extorting one another, doing all sorts of maybe crooked business deals among one another. You do this even to your brethren. So he's chastising them for two things. Doing this in the first place and then doing it to your brother and sister in Christ. Now here's a controversial part that's uh, difficult for a lot of people today to accept. But verses 9 and 10. Paul is talking about a string of things here that will not inherit the kingdom of God. God people that are doing these things. Um... And he starts out once again with sexual immorality. As we know, the term fornication dealt with any kind of sexual immorality. And it says, nor idolaters, uh, people that uh, are elevating statues and, and this type of thing uh, to a level of worship. Uh, anything that really that we worship above God is not something that God wants to see in our heart nor adulterers, it's pretty clear what that is, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. And this is where it gets controversial because many times, because people in the past have been uh, abusive and violent, acted in a, in a way of bigotry toward homosexuals or people that are uh, of an effeminate nature or conduct themselves in an effeminate way, this is where a lot of Christians fail to look at this the way it is presented. So here, when he talks about effeminate and homosexuals, he is talking about a list of sexual sins that are just wrong, considered sexual immorality. And it is included among the list of things called thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, 
a lot of times uh, people get caught up in these two sexual sins. But this is included among the list. Some people don't want to see it there, but it is there. It is there in the original language and it is there in English. Effeminate and homosexuals. Now, this is not to say that we discriminate against homosexuals, treat them badly, act bigoted in a way toward them, because God is a God of love. And we are to leave people in the hands of God on any of these sexual sins, adultery, sexual immorality between heterosexuals. We are to leave people in God's hands. And if we do that, it would be a better thing. Our goal is to show people the love of God. And that is our job, is to show the love of God in this world. It is not our job to rain down judgment on every single sin that we see in this world. We are to live the life that God has shown us in his word and be living epistles and draw people to Jesus Christ. Christ does the changing, not us. So this is uh, a scripture actually is very clear that, that the Bible does not condone same-sex relationships. He says, but such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. As always, let's do a quick word study here. Now, the first word we're going to cover is malakos. That is the word that is translated effeminate. It means soft or delicate or feminine. The other word is arsenikoi pace. Koi pace. All right, it's kind of a tongue twister. Arsenikoi pace. Anyway, so it's properly defined as a man in bed with another man. It comes from the two words arsen, meaning male, and koi pe, meaning a, a bed. So it is the man in your bed. The same gender sex is what he is referring to here. And then this last word is boitikos. And that we found in our first set of scriptures when uh, it talks about matters of this life in verse 4. So he is the, the word there is Boitikos, which is translated matters of this life, talking about present existence. I'm glad you took time to join us today. Again, these scriptures are meant to be a supplement to your personal Bible study. Certainly check me out, follow it up, try and look up these scriptures and words yourself. You can come to your own conclusions and we'll see you. So we left 1 Corinthians 5 with